Hey everybody, my name is Max. I've been working in the developer productivity space for about 20 years. Uh, once upon a time, I was the chief architect of the Bugzilla project, which we believe to be the most popular bug tracking system in the world at that time. Then I was the tech lead for Code Health at Google for a while. And nowadays I'm one of the tech leads for LinkedIn's productivity and happiness organization. I think a lot of us are here because we work on developer productivity tooling or infrastructure, or because it's something we care about. We're always hearing about how to make it better. What if we took a break from that for a little bit and talked about some easy ways that we could make our developers unproductive and unhappy? And you know, maybe I'll throw in some tips for how not to do that. So here's a good one. We're developers, right? We write software, or we did in the past. We know what developers want, don't we? We already know what their pain points are and we know how they ought to work. So why go talk to anybody? We don't need to talk to our developers to, or find out what their problems are. Surely everybody works just like us and has the same problems we do. All those people who are angry with the developer platform team, they're probably just holding it wrong. And all those angry executives, we just know better than they do. Okay, so what should we do? Basically, just find out what's up from the developers. If you have a small team, the best way to do this is to go around and interview engineers, tech leads, and frontline managers. Don't just go ask the VP of engineering. You have to talk to people who write code for a living. If you have a larger org, if you aren't doing a survey, just start doing some sort of survey and then probably follow it up with a small number of in-person interviews to get clarity on what the basic problems are. Doing a survey is hard. And if you want recommendations for companies that can help you with that, then you can find me after this talk and I'll give you some suggestions. But honestly, even a bad survey is better than nothing. You can even just start off asking people to give a one to five rating to the question, I regularly reach a high level of productivity. That's, there is some research to validate that particular question. And then provide them a free text box that says something like, what are currently the most frustrating barriers to your productivity? And that could be your whole survey. I'm not saying that should be your whole survey, but it could be. And if you're not doing a survey currently, just those two questions would get you a lot of really useful information. So this leads pretty well into our next topic, which is we're tool developers. Doesn't everybody work just the same way we do? Everybody writes Python command line tools, right? Everybody in the whole company? Uh, oh, wait. There's a lot of backend developers writing in some other language too, like, I don't know, Java or something. Eh, I guess we need to make some tools for them too. And you know, you know what, actually, they are the largest group of developers. So we'll be safe if we just make tools for them and everybody else can use their tools. Hmm, maybe not. Keep in mind that sometimes there are small groups of developers whose work is extraordinarily impactful to the business they might work very differently than the rest of the company. You might only employ a few machine learning engineers, but the work they do is probably critical to the success of your business. The same with mobile developers. Usually you have fewer of those than you have people working on the backend servers, but for most of us, the majority of our user base is on mobile devices. So basically, you want to understand developer pain points split by types of workflows that people have, mobile, web, backend, et cetera, and then use that data to prioritize work appropriately. There's no silver bullet for how to do that prioritization. We have to depend on the judgment of managers. That's why we employ people to be managers. It requires human decision-making, but we can make those calls much easier if we give management the right data. There's a lot more to know about that, but that's the basics. So now that we know how people work, we have a solution. It's beautiful, beautiful, done. One giant complex platform that will serve everybody and that everybody must use. There will be no other options. There will be no escape hatches. Everybody will work the exact same way, a way that we in our infinite wisdom have perfectly predicted and have thus built the one true tool to rule them all. Oh, your need doesn't fit into my perfect tool? 
mm, can you wait two and a half years and I'll develop the feature that you need? Just don't do any development until then. Just, just, just wait for us. You'll be fine, right? Oh, well, oh, I guess that didn't work. I guess we can't have a developer platform and we'll just have to let everybody do whatever they want. Oh, wait, what happened with that? A few hundred developers are now using that hot new programming language and they wrote how many millions of lines of code in it? And now they need us to create infrastructure for them? All of a sudden, with no warning? Well, that sounds like a fun conversation with our executive leadership. I can't wait to have that talk. Okay, so what do you really do in this situation? Ideally, you want a paved path for 80 to 90% of your developers. Most developers don't actually want to have to make decisions like, what language should I be writing in? What tool should I use for basic monitoring and alerting? What configuration language should I use for my deployments? Even though people can feel very passionate about these subjects, at the end of the day, most developers just want to do the job they have been assigned, which is to create impact for the business. They don't actually want to make a million infrastructure decisions and spend a month configuring all that infrastructure before they can even take the first step on their own project. So for most use cases, there should be a set of tools and frameworks that you have combined intelligently into a cohesive platform that frees developers of having to make decisions they don't actually need to make. However, there must be some sort of escape hatch for the other 10 to 20% of use cases. If you try to handle those 10 to 20% of use cases in your paved path platform, then your platform becomes too complex for the 80% use cases. In essence, the platform team has to be able to say no. They have to be able to say, no, we won't support that feature in the paved path, but here are a bunch of individual components that you can put together yourself to solve your own problem. Basically, your platform should be able to be decomposed into individual pieces so that when people need more power than the platform gives them, they can directly access all the power of the tools underneath. You might need to say, hey, if you break the glass, you don't get to use any of that paved path. But that's okay for most of the teams who want something very custom because those are the teams that want to be making those decisions. If you want to understand what I'm talking about, here's an example. Most deployments should probably happen magically via a nice UI. You've written a configuration file that describes your build and the system just picks it up and sends it out on a certain schedule. Uh, and you, maybe you have some control over how many servers you use and what the distribution of them across the world is, but you don't have to write a bunch of complex deployment scripts. You just sort of say your intent. But a few teams might need direct access to something like Kubernetes underneath to do more complex deployments. Your platform has to account for that. It needs to let people break the glass and use the pieces underneath if they have to. All right, let's have some more fun. What's more fun than waiting for somebody else to grant you permission to do your job? One of my favorite things is to have to file 10 tickets every time I want to do anything and then wait for 20 people to approve those 10 tickets. It's even better if those 10 tickets don't share any information and I have to explain the same thing over and over to distant reviewers who know nothing about my work. <laughs> I, I, I feel like maybe somebody has experienced that in the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So what really happens here? How does this actually come about? What really happens is that a team perceives a risk or a quality problem that probably should be solved by automation, but that automation seems hard to write. So instead, they implement a human review process where somebody has to say yes before some sort of work can continue. And what ends up happening is a lot of different stakeholders across the company all do this separately without actually communicating with each other. So one engineer now has to go through many different human review processes every time they want to do anything. This has a lot of problems. It stifles innovation. It makes people want to move to a waterfall model instead of an agile model because the risk they are now trying to mitigate is how long the review process takes. And they want to limit how many times they have to go through it. 
in general, it actually can stagnate your whole business because it makes it hard to adapt to changes rapidly that happen in the outside world and puts you at risk of somebody more agile coming along and actually taking market share from you. The only time you really need human review processes is when the bar you're trying to uphold is about human perception. For example, the reason that code review exists is to make sure that code can be easily understood and maintained by other human beings. It's similar with somebody editing a newsletter. It's about how the readers will perceive the newsletter. So those are valid human review processes. All the other ones should ideally be eliminated, or if you can't eliminate them, make them non-blocking so people can continue to do work while they wait for the review. I could give you a whole talk about how to eliminate them, uh, but one simple way is to create automation that enforces the thing you were previously reviewing for. Another common way is to change something about the coding framework so that the problem you were reviewing for is no longer possible. For example, the framework doesn't even have that feature anymore that you needed to get a human sign off on. I would love to talk more about this. Uh, I could easily talk about it for an entire hour, but unfortunately, we don't have that much time right now. Now, a lot of what I've talked about today has been specific to platform or infrastructure teams, but I have a great way that everybody can contribute to unproductivity and unhappiness across the whole company, no matter where you sit. And that's this. If you start something, never finish it. If you start a migration from one technology to another, make sure you always drop it in the middle. If you're developing a new tool, make sure that you de-staff the team that owns the tool right after its launch. Don't respond to feedback or polish the tool, heaven forbid. Just de-staff the team so they can go work on some other new thing. Okay, so realistically, this actually happens a lot. The trouble is that you can get into a situation where your developers are walking through a minefield of incomplete migrations and tools. Every infrastructure team makes these decisions individually, but they add up to a mess that frontline engineers have to deal with every day. If this continues for long enough, it can actually become the number one productivity problem for your whole business. It happens for many reasons, but one of them is that it's not clear to engineering management why we need to finish the work that we started or what finished really means. This is a skill that tech leads and frontline managers need to develop, which is explaining why it's important to finish things that we have started and say when something really is finished. So what do I mean by finished? The simple rule that I apply is, a task is finished when no human being will have to pay attention to it anymore. You can't achieve that in the absolute sense. There's always some amount of human, tiny amount of human attention that is going to be required to some system as time goes on. The world will change. Software requires maintenance in order to keep working and stay relevant. But you can ask any engineer who's working on a system, what are the things that you feel like you still have to pay attention to about this system? They will tell you, honestly, they probably think about it in the shower in the morning. Like, that's what I did. When I was writing developer tools full time, like sitting in front of a machine, I would wake up in the morning, I'd be like, oh man, there's that thing, I gotta fix it. Oh, I gotta file, or I gotta file a ticket for it. Oh, I haven't filed this ticket, I gotta file this ticket. And if your company is in this state where there's a bunch of incomplete things, you can survey your developers or interview them, which can be more effective, to find out which of these incomplete things are causing the most trouble. Then you can start a focused effort to finish them while you develop the tools, infrastructure, and cultural change necessary to prevent the problem from reoccurring. It's not just like you can show up and be like, one day, now we're going to engage in one massive effort to finish everything, but then not actually make the problem not come back. That's it, that itself is a thing you need to finish, making the thing not come back. All right. I hope that this has been helpful, and I hope you have a great time at the rest of today's talks.